A little while ago I did a review of the N64 version of Shadow Man. To briefly summarise, it's one of my favourite games on the N64 and even playing it all these years later I still love it. Thing is, there are a number of people mentioned in the game, some being people I'd heard of, while the rest I just thought were made up for the scene or joke they were mentioned in. It turns out all but one are real and some of the things I've read about them were fascinating, others horrific, so I thought I'd share what I've discovered with all you lovely people. There will be some grisly pictures shown, so a little bit of discretion is advised. There was only one person I couldn't find anything on. Uh, well, there was that little incident with Tommy Lee on that guy a while back. The closest I could find was the Tommy Lee that is the founding member of the heavy metal group The Motley Crew, or Tommy Lee Edwards, an artist who has been involved in comic books, computer games, films, and loads of other things, but both those people are still alive, so I'm stumped. For those I did find stuff for, I'll be starting with the people you'll probably already know, so we won't be talking about them for too long, but we'll end with the more fascinating, unusual, and psychopathic individuals. First on the list will be someone I'm pretty sure you'd at least have heard of. To the say, eh, Michael? Just open the gate, Johnny. Did I ever tell you about the time me and Attila the Hun were playing skittles with the guillotine heads of the French aristocracy? Johnny. Attila the Hun was the leader of a group known as... Well, the Huns, a group of nomadic people that lived in Eastern Europe and Central Asia between the 1st and 3rd century. Attila lived from 406 AD until 453, becoming the leader of the Huns in 434. He invaded and conquered numerous places, becoming one of the most feared enemies of the Roman Empire. He travelled to so many places trying to conquer them, I'm not even going to try and cover them. Though he accomplished a lot during his life, how he died seems to be under a lot of debate. One theory suggests he was murdered by his wife, though most scholars reject this as hearsay. Another theory is that he drank too much, which caused the dilated veins in his esophagus to rupture, resulting in him internally bleeding to death, while another theory is that he got a nosebleed and choked. He was supposedly laid to rest in a triple coffin made of gold, silver and iron, though when I was researching this, I initially read that as a tripe coffin. Slight difference. Some of his men diverted part of a river and buried the coffin under the riverbed. The these men were then killed to keep the exact location a secret. My biggest question though, how the hell did Jaunty play Skittles? He doesn't have any arms. On to the next well-known person and I'll be amazed if you've never heard of him. By my deeds am I known, and I am known as Jack. Springy or Jack. Jack the Ripper was a serial killer who murdered five prostitutes between the 31st of August and 9th of November 1888 around Whitechapel in London. The victims, which the game names in the order of their murder, Mary Ann Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes, Mary Kelly had their throats cut and were then mutilated, some even had organs removed. Nettie's file gives more information on the case, which is spot on, and seeing as Jack's monologue at the start of the game takes place on the same date the final murder happened, the 9th of November, 1888. it gives Truly a new reason for why the murders happened, but the immortal power I sought within the sordid confines of their bodies, the still beating organ of the soul was not to be found. And but why they, they stopped. Died. Then, if I am to join you, I must die. It is prophecy. We cannot fail, for we are many. For we are many. I doubt it, but you never know. Amen to that. There were many more murders in subsequent years that were not attributed to Jack the Ripper as there was a lack of evidence, such as the bodies not being mutilated after death. The main five became known as the canonical murders. It is still unknown who Jack the Ripper actually was, but there are over a hundred suspects. The picture used in Nettie's file looks remarkably similar to Neil Thomas Cream, who was hanged on the 15th of November 1892 for numerous murders in the USA and England. While standing on the scaffold, his final words were supposedly, I am Jack the, but he was hanged before he could finish the sentence. However, police officers and other officials present at the hanging made no mention of this happening, and it is thought that if he did say something, it was misinterpreted due to him not being able to finish the sentence. Problem is, at the time of the last three canonical murders, Neil Cream was in Joliet Prison in Chicago and didn't come to England until 1891. There were a couple of things that seemed to be made up for the game. On Jack's journal, it states his name as John G. Pierce, but none of the people suspected of being Jack the Ripper have this name, nor do any of them share his profession. What is it that you want from me? You are an architect by trade, are you not? I am. I suppose it makes sense, as basing the character on a real person could land the company in some hot water. And others like us may join together into what Let's move on to the main bad guy of the game. Who are you? My name is Legion, for we are many. 
It's mentioned in the game as well as the instruction manual that the phrase for we are many is a quote from the Bible, Mark chapter 5 verse 9, but it never delves into who or what Legion is, so let's have a quick look. According to the Bible, Legion is actually a group of demons, hence the phrase for we are many, that have possessed someone, but it's thought the demons are meant to represent the Roman Legion. The man lives in tombs and is so strong and violent, none of the people from a nearby town are able to restrain him, even if chains are used. Jesus happens to be passing by with his disciples, so the possessed man throws himself at Jesus' feet and begs not to be harmed. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. The demons ask if they can be put into some nearby pigs and Jesus complies. The herd then rushes into a nearby lake and drowns. The people tending the pigs run to town to tell people what happened, some of whom want to see it for themselves. They find the man now sane but are disturbed by what happened, so ask Jesus to leave. The saved man asks Jesus if he can go with him, but Jesus tells him to return home to his family and tell of what God has done for him. He travels all over the country telling his story. This isn't the only time the story appears in the Bible. Luke chapter 8 verse 30 as well as Matthew chapter 8 verse 28 mention it though Matthew stated two possessed men were healed by Jesus. All this is said to take place in northern Jordan and the town is thought to be Gadara which is now in ruin but the town of Um Kais is near the site of the ruins. Now we have the person that being mentioned in the game made me wonder if they were real people and looked them up. See that bloody big black power yonder? How could I miss it? Well, old Bruegel, the medieval painter bloke, he was just telling me the other day that he thought it looked remarkably like a picture he once did. Is that Peter Bruegel? No, shame it. It's this isn't Irish cousin. Peter Bruegel was a Dutch Renaissance painter who lived in the mid-1500s. He did a number of paintings during his life, and although I don't know much about art or really have a whole lot of interest in the subject, even I have to admit his paintings are amazing. The one referred to in the game that looks like the Asylum is a painting called The Tower of Babel. Is it Babel or Babel? I don't know. Anyway, while it looks similar, there's another painting called The Little Tower of Babel that looks even more like the Asylum. I'm not sure if the game producers used this painting as inspiration for the Asylum, or if it was just a coincidence they decided to reference when they noticed it. The Tower of Babel itself is actually another Bible reference told in the book of Genesis as an explanation of why we have so many different languages in the world. At first, humanity was united and spoke one language. As they migrated from the east, they settled in the land of Shinar, which is roughly where Iraq is today. Here, the people decided to build a town with a tower that had its top in the heavens. God looked at the city and tower and said, Indeed, the people are one and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So he did, scattering the people all over the world and gave them different languages so they were no longer able to understand each other. As a result, construction stopped and the town became known as Babel. This is why in the paintings, the tower is unfinished. So in essence, God saw people were able to achieve wondrous things working together, so ruined it by making it so they couldn't understand each other. What a dick. The final person we are going to look into is the most horrific. When you do finally get into the asylum, make sure you tell Jeffrey Dahmer I said, how are you? Just as a warning before I delve too much into his deeds, I'll quote the first paragraph of his Wikipedia page. Jeffrey Lionel Dahmer, aka the Milwaukee Cannibal, was an American serial killer and sex offender who committed the rape, murder and dismemberment of 17 men and boys between 1978 and 1991, with many of his later murders also involving necrophilia, cannibalism and the permanent preservation of body parts, typically all or part of the skeletal structure. I do have my own extra theory about why Jaunty mentions him, but if you don't want to know any more, you might as well go to another video. Here are some suggestions. They're all pretty good, but for those of you that are intrigued, let's take a closer look and see what you think of my theory. I won't go too much into Jeffrey's childhood, but he was a quiet and uncommunicative child, to the point one of his teachers described him as reserved and sensed he was being neglected by his parents. Even at a young age, he would dissect dead animals and keep parts of the bodies, saying he was interested in how the animals fitted together. When he asked his father Lionel what would happen if the leftover chicken bones were put into bleach, Lionel, thinking it was scientific curiosity, showed Jeffrey how bleach can be used to preserve bones, which Jeffrey used on the bones of the animals and eventually people he killed. 
At the age of 18, Jeffrey committed his first murder, 18-year-old Stephen Hicks. Jeffrey lured Stephen to his house, where he hit Stephen on the back of the head twice with a dumbbell, causing him to lose consciousness. Jeffrey then strangled Stephen's unconscious body with the bar of the dumbbell, took Stephen's clothes off and masturbated over the corpse. Jeffrey dissected the body and buried it in his back garden. He dug up the remains a few weeks later, removed the flesh from the bones, dissolved the flesh in acid and flushed it down the toilet. He crushed the bones with a sledgehammer and scattered them in a nearby woodland. His next murder wasn't until 1987, at the age of 27, where he lured 25-year-old Stephen Taromi to the Ambassador Hotel where Jeffrey was staying, but he claimed he never intended to kill Stephen. He was planning on drugging him and then having sex with his unconscious body, but the following morning found Stephen beneath him with his chest crushed in, but has no memory of killing him. He placed the body in a suitcase and took it home. He removed the head and then the flesh from the rest of the skeleton. He put the flesh into bags and crushed the skeleton with a sledgehammer, but kept the head which he preserved and used as a stimulus for masturbation. He eventually got rid of the head after it became too brittle to use. It was after this that Jeffrey actively sought victims, with each one being drugged and strangled. He would have sex with them, but not always before he strangled them. In every case, the body was disposed of, but the head and occasionally organs or genitalia were kept and preserved. He killed many people over the following year, sometimes as often as one a week, until July 1991, when his would-be victim, 32-year-old Tracy Edward, was able to escape and return with police, who found photographs Jeffrey took of his previous victims' corpses in suggestive poses, as well as the process of dismissing remembering the bodies. Jeffy was arrested and commented, for what I did, I should be dead. After a more thorough search of the flat by the Criminal Investigation Bureau, 74 Polaroid pictures of the corpses and dismemberment process were found. Four severed heads were found in the kitchen and a total of seven skulls, some had been painted or bleached for preservation, in his bedroom and closet. In the fridge, there were trays which collected blood drippings, two human hearts and a portion of arm muscle, all kept in plastic bags. In his freezer, they found an entire torso, a bag of human organs and flesh stuck to the ice at the bottom. Also around the rest of the flat, they found two entire skeletons, a pair of severed hands, two severed and preserved penises, and a mummified scalp. Three dismembered torsos were found in a 57-gallon drum dissolving in an acid solution. There's far more to his story than what I've mentioned, but it would take far too long to go into everything. In the end, Jeffrey pleaded guilty to the murders and was given 16 life sentences, but was murdered on the 28th of November 1994 by a fellow inmate who was also serving time for murder. Now, on to my theory. One of the common occurrences with Jeffrey's murders is that he kept the heads, sometimes using them for sexual gratification, and preserved some of the skulls, intending to turn them into a shrine. Now listen to one of the ways Shadow Man describes Jaunty. He doesn't, and we win the day. I'll be buying you that drink, even if you are an annoying, half-witted, skull-headed snake. It's clear Jaunty and Jeffrey were friends, as Jaunty asks you to... Tell Jeffrey Dahmer I said, how you? But considering what Jeffrey did during his life, particularly with heads and skulls, maybe the two of them had something else going on. Can't you see that? There's one last thing to mention that could have been inspired by Jeffrey's actions. There's a comedy sketch show called Robot Chicken, and this is one of the sketches. Oh my god! Jeffrey! We're out of ice cream! Maybe I'm jumping to conclusions here, but we have several skulls preserved in a freezer, and it just so happens the bloke she speaks to is called Jeffrey. It could just be a coincidence, but you never know, maybe some aspects of it were based on Jeffrey Dharma. If Seth Green or anyone from the Robot Chicken team happens to be watching and can confirm either way, I'd be very grateful. Well, that brings this curiosity to an end. If you haven't seen my review of Shadow Man, then here's a link to the video. But for now, thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed it, and see you next time. I'll be along with you and stop asking me these bloody stupid questions.